Well, hello, everybody. I don't know if everyone has actually joined the room. Uh, we're starting about a minute late. Um, but I will begin. And uh, it's very strange not to have, uh, have people in the room that I'm talking to, but I'm bearing with it. And I hope you'll bear with me if I get confused or forget anything. I don't know why I didn't realize until about 20 minutes ago that essentially what I had agreed to do is do an hour by myself talking by myself, which, um, you know, should be something that I'm comfortable with, but uh, I don't know who I am. So uh, at any rate, I'm going to share my screen and I hope you all will be able to see this. And essentially what we have here is my name and um, my name is Mark Joyella. I'm the content manager for the enterprise business agility team at IBM. And I'm seeing people in the chat saying that uh, you're here. So that's good. That makes me feel like I'm, I'm not uh, talking to myself at my desk, uh, which is fine. I do that a lot in quarantine uh, at any rate. Uh, I've been at IBM for about, this is my fourth year. And uh, I thought I'd start by telling you guys a little bit about me, um, my story, how I, uh, how I came to be presenting on this topic today. And, uh, and then we can talk more broadly about ways I think um, from my experience. And again, um, as you'll here in just a few minutes, I, I, I'm pretty new to all of this still. And um, uh, so you may at times detect that I'm, uh, you know, uncomfortable or haven't got the swing of it, but there are certain things that um, uh, presenter view, somebody says, pr change the slide deck to presenter view. Have I not done that? Let's see. Uh, let's see. I am. Uh, can do this, see if this helps. I think it's in presenter view, but are you all seeing that relatively easily? Can you see most of this? <laughs> I hope so. Um, yeah, I don't think you need to see my desktop and all the other junk that accumulates there every day. Um, here we go. Yeah, I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to see the chat if I didn't go full screen, so hang on, let me just make sure that, um, yeah, okay. I am wasting enough time getting set up. Um, I did wanna mention that you already have done this. Uh, you've already found that you can, you know, there are tabs in there for chat and polls. Um, there is one question that I asked that uh, feel free to answer if you like. If you don't, that's great. And that was what brings you to the session today. And that's just an, an open-ended thing. It gives me an idea of uh, kind of, who all's here and who all has uh, maybe specific things that hopefully I can um, I can answer in our time together and I pretend I didn't do that. So at any rate, uh, a little bit more about me. So for most of my career, uh, 25 years, uh, I was a TV news journalist. I was a reporter and uh, television anchor at television stations in um, in you know cities large and small across the country, where uh, my first job was as a as an intern in in Grand Junction, Colorado, and uh, uh, it was such a small market that um, about six months later I wasn't an intern anymore. I was the morning anchor, so things moved very quickly, and I started moving around the country uh, as a reporter uh, in TV. Um, the funny thing is, after joining IBM. A few years ago, uh, IBM had an internal communications effort to start a, essentially a weekly newscast. And oddly enough, I found my way into it. And a lot of people are like, wow, you really do seem to know how to do that. I'm like, well, you know, I have a little background. And then the third thing here at the bottom, first year as a bicon. And uh, that's because the, the, uh, the bisexuality part of it all comes out. Uh, is really a very recent thing. And um, it's only in the past, uh, I guess, 12 months that this has been something that I've realized about myself and realized was something that um, I could accept and embrace and explore. And um, 
So my first year as a bicon, and so anybody who is not already familiar with the world of bisexuality needs to know this right away, and that is that uh, puns are kind of part of the deal. Uh, if you do a search on bisexual puns, you will find things like this, you know, bi five, biology, bi fi. It's a, a rabbit hole you can go down and and. Um, you could, uh, there are just endless variations on this and it seems to come with the territory. Uh, if you have good ones, feel free to share them in the chat, but uh, I enjoy them and I wanted to keep it light. Because the next part of the, the story, and I wanna get to this before I really come to my coming out part of my story is um, why uh, for guys in particular, the coming out thing often doesn't ever happen. Um, and if you've attended any of the other bisexual related events here at the summit, you've probably seen some of these statistics similar, if not the exact same one. And this is a Pew Research study. And the question is, who are you, or are you out to the most important people in your life? And that can be people at work, that can be your family, that can be your friends and not your family. Um, but it's striking when you look at this and you see, you know, 75% of, of gay and lesbian, uh, I believe these were Americans who were surveyed, are out um, to the most important people. And 19% of bisexuals. And what's, uh, what's worse is that the guys are the least likely of them all. And um, some of the, I've done, you know, I love to look at research papers. I will find research. And then if you ever have looked at a research paper, you know that at the end of the research paper is all the research papers that the person who did the first research paper read. And so you can go look at those too. And I'm always trying to understand things. And um, uh, this is one of the things that I think is a factor for, for guys in particular. And that is that there is tremendous uh, social stigma for guys to be bisexual. Women is accepted much more. Um, but if you look at the, the chart on the left-hand side, um, only 8%, and this is everyone in the LGBT community saying this, you know, 8% uh, feel that there is a lot of social acceptance for being bisexual. And, and I think that plays heavily on, on guys who may be questioning, may be thinking about um, being out to the people who they care most about and worrying about whether they can actually do that. And, you know, how society sees you, especially if you're considering uh, being out in the workplace, you know, um, you worry about all of the stuff that's built up around the, uh, the reasons that only 8% would say that about bisexual guys. Um, and just to give you a, a sense of how even good news for bisexuals is sometimes uh, a reminder of just how lousy it is. This is from this year, and this is a magazine, I guess you call them a journal if it's a research thing. It's the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, PNAS. And I don't know anything about this research uh, journal, but I know that the lead story on the cover was green coloration of frogs. And the story that I'm here to talk about is robust evidence for bisexual orientation among men. So essentially in 2020, researchers were publishing a study said, yeah, it exists, it's real. In the magazine that says, and frogs are green. To me that this is apparently the scientific equivalent of the very obvious things in science that need to be repeated. But for guys, you end up faced with, yeah, that's not really a thing. And the stereotypes that swing around all of this, the stereotypes that hide behind um, something like that are usually that, uh, and this is unique, I think, to guys that bisexual women don't necessarily face as much 
uh, is that, you know, oh, if you're bisexual, you're saying you're bisexual, that's just the first step in you eventually telling us that you are, in fact, gay. And, um, you know, for, and I've, in the short time that I've been out, I've heard from other guys, guys like myself, middle-aged, you know, uh, mid-career, um, uh, established, have good careers, have families, you know, I'm, I'm like the uh, example of the, the person that maybe you, on first glance you don't think about, you know, married to a woman, children, live in the suburbs, boring, you know, in every possible way. Um, and in that regard, the sexuality aspect of it basically becomes invisible. Um, so this study was ridiculed uh, among bisexuals, um, as you might imagine. But the survey's uh, results, and I apologize, I don't know how to do the page down on my, on my keyboard. So the, the, here's how they came to their scientific uh, analysis. Um, this is not that frogs are green. That's a separate article, but this one says, highly robust results, highly robust showed that bisexual identified men's genital and subjective arousal patterns were more bisexual than were those who identified as exclusively heterosexual or homosexual. These findings support the view that male sexual orientation contains a range from heterosexuality to bisexuality to homosexuality. I've never really come to a full understanding of um, the scientists who decide how they're going to evaluate someone's arousal. Um, but I'm gonna leave that aside for now. At any rate, uh, this, is, this is the world we live in. One of the other aspects, and this was an aspect that affected me because of my age, you know, I'm 54, so, uh, you know, just do the math. Uh, when I was growing up, um, <laughs> you know, bisexual invisibility was like, you know, obviously, I mean, there was, there, there were very few, you know, uh, you know, really, you know, out gay lesbian uh, role models in, in the world, in, in uh, fiction, in, in any way, the media didn't, it wasn't a thing. Um, and, you know, God forbid that there would be a, a, a bisexual male role model to look up to as a, as a, as a 13 year old who is suddenly wondering, wow, this is um, different feeling that doesn't fit in with what my friends are telling me. Um, this is a UK report, the bisexuality report that concluded, you know, generally speaking, bisexual invisibility is standard in the media. And this again is a, you know, this is today. This, these are modern references. Uh, the, the story goes on to say, when bisexuality is depicted in the media, it is generally portrayed in a negative light. Bisexual people were depicted overwhelmingly negatively, for example, as greedy. Bisexual people in films were portrayed as promiscuous, wicked people with insatiable desires, and their bisexual behavior was often linked to tragedy. And so one person was quoted in the He's saying, if Hollywood is any guide, it is not safe to be bisexual or to be in the company of people who are. And again, this gets at all of these enduring stereotypes about bisexuals that they can't just be in a single relationship, that they must need one of each to be happy. They uh, will never get enough. They can never be trusted because if you are uh, an opposite sex partner or a same sex partner with a bisexual, they're obviously going to leave you for the other gender. This is how you know, it's seen. This is the stereotype, not me talking, but uh, because they have to have it. Um, that's, you know, uh, just going back to my um, boring self, uh, you know, it's like saying, well, you can't be married to your wife because she's a, you know, she has brown hair and you also like redheads and, you know, you're going to need one at some point. So he's going to leave you. It's like that. I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me and neither does the other. Uh, there are plenty of uh, people in very committed relationships. Um, so going back to how I ended up sort of in the face of all that, uh, ending up here, at, you know, at the workplace summit, which is like my mind exploding. Um, uh, I have an intersection and the intersection for me is mental illness. Um, the, the funny thing is I, I dealt with that first and came out. What you're looking at is, um, is the uh, cover art for a, for a piece that I wrote 
2014 when I was a news anchor in Orlando, Florida. And for years I had been, um, you know, I had been untreated and very, very unhappy. I had uh, really uh, crippling anxiety um, and only very, very late in life, only around my 40th birthday did I ever uh, begin to sort of take it seriously and get treatment for it. And uh, that was because I realized that um, I was never going to have a real relationship, a life that I wanted, because I just couldn't figure out how to do that without, um, well, what, what I needed to do was get healthy. And I did, and I started taking medicine, and I started doing great. Um, by 2014, however, I had started to become upset uh, while sitting on the anchor desk in Orlando as I was introducing stories that dealt with mental illness. And, you know, if you want to talk about stereotypes and things like that, uh, the way we talk about people with mental illness is really archaic. It, it, it sounds very much unchanged from the times of uh, people being uh, locked away in prisons rather than hospitals and uh, if you just think about uh, the most common phrase is, you know, he's battling his demons, right? Well, no, he's not. <laughs> I mean, that's not what's happening. He has an illness. We don't say that somebody with kidney disease is battling their demons because that doesn't make any sense. That sounds ridiculous. But somehow with mental illness, we say, oh, he's battling demons, which is exactly what, of course, they said in the Middle Ages when they said he's possessed by a demon and needs to be locked in chains. Uh, so I was struggling with that. And I finally came to a point where a story that we reported, I thought was just horrendous. And I needed to speak. I needed to say something in the newsroom to object to it. And I wrote an email to my boss right from that desk that I'm sitting at in the picture. And I said, we've got it. And halfway through it, I realized he's going to ask me why it's so important to me. And that's going to put me in a position of having to out myself. And I couldn't do it. But uh, and so I deleted the email, never, never sent it. And, um, but over the next few weeks and months, it became uh, so upsetting to me that I decided I needed to just get this out there. I was afraid, of course, of what people would think. I was afraid how it might impact my career. Uh, and um, so I wrote this piece and I, I, I used the phrase, I'm coming out. Um, and the reaction was fabulous. I, I, nobody, nobody gave me a hard time. Nobody called me names. Everybody supported me. And I actually heard from a lot of people that I'd known for many years who said, yeah, me too. Um, and it, that was great. So um, over the last, let's see, about two years ago, um, I went to get a master's degree at the University of Georgia. In, in, uh, it's an MFA program, which is a uh, a low residency program in writing. And um, uh, one of the things I focused on in that two years was sort of trying to figure out, you know, where did my anxiety come from? What, you know, how did it affect my life? And at one point I wrote this piece about something that had, um, and if I could tell you how many times I have thought about this since I was in middle school, I, I, it just, I couldn't put a number on it. Um, but it, one day when I was in middle school, after gym, some kid came up to me, grabbed me, pushed me against the wall and said, say it. And, uh, what he wanted me to say was I'm gay. And I thought at the time, what do I have to do to not get beaten up? And so I said it and, um, I just never, it just, it, it, it stuck with me and it kind of haunted me. And I, I wrote this piece about it as if the words that I was, the words, you know, I'm gay, uh, which I wasn't, um, were like a revelation that was the, the payoff of the piece that I wrote. And the, the professor, you know, at the program said, I'm interested to know why you think that that's a bad thing. You know, why is, it, why is there so much around this piece? And, uh, and that opened up a new sort of uh, window for me into a lot of the 
internalized homophobia that I had been living with from a super young age, where whether it's, you know, did, you know, was I picked on for that reason? Did, did I seem that, you know, I wasn't just a regular boy? Uh, and then I can, I can very clearly think of all of the times through my life when people have either um, teased me or said something to me strange. Like I, I remember going for a run, to, just not to get too far off track, I hope, but uh, going for a run in Birmingham, Alabama one day and some guys shouted at me out of the car and used a, you know, a, a homophobic slur at me. And I didn't think, wow, those guys are just total jerks and go on with my run. I started to think, how, you know, why do they think that? And what do I need to do to appear? Essentially, what did they see and how do I get rid of it so that nobody does that to me again? Um, and I think this is part of what guys go through. Um, but it was this writing program and combination of working with on my mental health, uh, doing some uh, therapy specifically around trauma that sort of cracked this thing open for me. And, I, you know, at one point it was just like, well, maybe a lot of this anxiety that I feel is basically this trying to keep a lid on all of this and trying to hide something that I think other people see. And what if it was something that I wasn't hiding anymore, but what if I was, you know, what if I just owned it and so on? So I'm gonna play a video for you and I, let me know in the chat if for any reason you can't hear the video. This is a video that I um, recorded and shared at work um, on uh, bye week, which was just a few weeks ago. I can't hear it. Okay. How do I figure that out? Can't hear the audio. So, um, that's frustrating. Let me figure out if I can, uh, Red, if you know any idea that I may have missed at the bottom here, um, how to play the video. I had, um, while I try and figure, troubleshoot this, <laughs> um, uh, I had, previously made a video at work about mental health and um, I had gotten such a great response to it. Um, this is what led me to do this as a way of, uh, there's a checkbox in the Zoom options. Let's see. Stop, sh uh, stop sharing and reshare, click the button to share audio. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. Hello, everyone. And then I'm going to share screen again. Ah, I got it. All right. I think this hopefully will work. Still no, okay, wow, hold on. <laughs> Did you click both buttons? Oh my gosh, okay. Hang on, let me try that again. So I need to, all right, so I'm gonna share desktop and, wait. Can you do that, both? All right, just let me, just tell me. Tell me again if you hear, anybody hear that? Oh my, this is annoying. I, yeah, I can hear it. I hear it in my ears, but I get, you guys are not. Um, so let's see, perhaps, oh, try taking out the headphones, okay. Dang. 
Tell me if this is the last time and then I'm going to voice this over live for you guys. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Joyella and this is Bi Week. Bi Week is the week each year when we celebrate <laughs> okay, the entire Bi Plus community. What do we mean by bisexual? Well, the best definition that I've ever heard comes from bi activist Robin Oakes, who puts it this way. I call myself bisexual because I acknowledge that I have in myself the potential to be attracted romantically and or sexually to people of more than one sex and or gender. Not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily in the same way, and not necessarily to the same degree. Now, she goes on to say, and this is important, for me, the bi in bisexual refers to the potential for attraction to people with genders similar to and different from my own. Bi week comes as we here in the eastern United States get our first hint of fall. The nights are starting to get cool and we can think forward to the turning of the leaves, all of those brilliant colors, reds, yellows, orange, and purple. It's tempting to think the colors are new, like a new coat of paint on a house, but here's why I bring up the fall colors. The color was there all along. It's just we didn't see those colors the rest of the year because of chlorophyll, which covers leaves in a coat of green from spring through summer. And I think many bisexuals are like that. Their vivid colors, like the bisexual flag of pink, lavender, and blue, they're always there. You just might not see them. Think of all the bisexuals you know in your family, your close friends, and your co-workers. How many do you know? Maybe nobody? Well, studies show as much as half of the lesbian, gay, and bisexual community identifies as bisexual. So where are they? Well, research by the Human Rights Campaign found that bisexuals often feel unable to bring their full selves to work and to be open about their identities, with a majority of bi workers being out to no one or only a few people at work. Bisexuals are less likely to self-report their sexual orientation, even in anonymous confidential human resource surveys. Just 59% compared to 77% of lesbian women and 79% of gay men. And the group least likely of all the LGBTQ orientations to be out to the most important people in their lives, bisexual men. Now, this is due in part to stereotypes of bisexuals and the lack of visibility and role models for bisexuals in general and bisexual men in particular. One study found fully 43% of LGBT workers say they've heard co-workers making jokes about bisexual people. Stigma and stereotypes are one of the main reasons why bisexuals feel unsafe coming out and why they have higher rates of mental illness than other members of the LGBTQ community. As one study put it, it has been argued that bisexuality has been delegitimized by negative stereotypes, 
such as bisexuality doesn't exist as a sexual orientation, bisexuals are sexually promiscuous, and bisexuals are confused. Several studies have found that heterosexual, gay, and lesbian individuals may all have negative attitudes toward bisexuality, indicating that bisexual individuals face a double discrimination. Now, a while back, you may have seen a video that I made about my own struggle with mental illness. And thanks, by the way, to everybody who has gotten in touch after watching it. I really appreciated it. But recently, in working through the roots of my anxiety and the effects of trauma, I realized I've spent enormous amounts of energy worrying about being seen as anything but a straight white male. In working with a therapist, I discovered, unfortunately, internalized homophobia that I'd worked really, really hard not to look at. But IBM invites all of us to be ourselves, no matter who we are. And so working here, while at the same time doing some really hard work in therapy, led me to decide it's time to accept myself. And wow, if that didn't release a lifetime of anxiety off my shoulders. So I make this video in the hopes that you will celebrate Bi Week by accepting the Bi people in your life and making sure the workplace and your world is safe and welcoming to everyone so they can feel comfortable being out. And to the bisexual guys out there, you know, I didn't have any bisexual role models growing up. So that gave me the nudge I needed to come out and stand up and say, if you've never seen a bisexual at work before, well, now you have. And guys, don't buy into anybody's definition of what a real man is. You get to figure that out, and I'm on your side. So happy bye week, everybody, and I'm around if you ever want to talk or need to check in. So thanks for watching that with me, everyone. Um, that was really hard to, to do. And one of the, the funny things, and I, I, I was at a few of the uh, bisexual track sessions yesterday at the summit. And um, I, I noticed, I heard other people talk about, you know, sometimes just saying that word for the first time out loud is like really hard, but it's also very powerful. Um, and, you know, that was for me very, I mean, I just, I was in my therapist's office going like, you know, we're dancing around it, dancing around it. You know, yeah, I feel like it's true. What's true? I feel like that, uh, you know, that maybe I am. You know, it's like you just don't want to say it. It's like a hard thing to say. So making the video was, um, was great. And, but what was even better uh, was some of what I heard. And, and again, this gets to the issues that I think all of us can work to resolve um, in our workplaces uh, if we're aware of, of uh, I'm going to share with you some of the comments I got um, from the video. Uh, one said, uh, this was from a, a woman, just so you know. Uh, I just watched the Bi-Week 2020 video you created and in tears to see this created and shared within IBM. It is perfect. Uh, I also got this, and this is from um, a man, and he wrote, just wanted to take a moment to thank you for role modeling vulnerability and sharing your own story uh, with IBMers around the world. Incredible to see your courage in working through your own internal challenges in a format like that. I've always been incredibly aware of the privileged position that I have as a gay white male as perhaps one of the most socially acceptable gender and sexual variations within the LGBTQIA community. Your story has opened my eyes to the challenges and perspective of others that I've never fully explored. Thank you for sharing your story and being a role model for others across our organization. That really, um, that struck me, you know, you, you like to, you like to know that at least the person that, can you all hear me? I see somebody saying, did the audio go out? I hope, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, uh, but uh, it was great to hear that because that was not an audience that I was, was trying to speak to, you know, I was trying to speak to people who needed to hear something that they weren't able to hear anywhere else. And uh, this is something that I heard in the session yesterday. Somebody said, you know, that's where I came out first at work because it's easier. And in many ways it is, it is so much easier. You have a, a kind of a, 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 a con, not confined, but you have a kind of a controlled environment, right? Where you can, 
engage with your business resource groups, or uh, that's we call them BRGs at IBM, but the ERGs, you know, other companies, uh, you can engage there, and you're not going to necessarily run into the guy who he lives three houses down who you know in your heart is going to be the one who's going to say something that's going to upset you. You know, you can be kind of strategic about it while also getting the sense of what it feels like to, to be your whole person and be, you know, walking around fine. Um, Oh, I thought I had added another, I, I'm, I'm bummed about that. Uh, if, uh, there was another comment I got just today and uh, from somebody who um, described uh, uh, coming out as a bisexual in, in um, you know, just a few years ago and saying that the challenge for him was the fact that, you know, he had a gay friend who was sort of skeptical of the orientation as being a thing. And then uh, straight friends or family who just didn't understand what he was even talking about. And, you know, that is something that is an issue and it does weigh on people and keep them from taking that step. And the step, you know, again, not to drive the point too many times, but the step that is a healthy, healthy step, it's, you know, letting that stuff go. I've, you know, just to share an example, um, you know, after, one of the first things I did was like, I, I, I bought like shirts that I would not have born, worn before because I would have thought, if I wear this shirt, isn't that a little gay? You know, that kind of thing. That was always part of my, that was always in my brain, that little voice saying, essentially uh, talking to me as if I'm the kid back in middle school, you know, if you wear this shirt, they're coming after you. If you you know, wear pink socks, they're going to come beat you up. And to realize the first few times, who cares? I've already said it. Nobody can threaten to say anything about me because I already said it. Um, I put this picture in. This was from uh, World Pride um, in New York City a year ago. And, you know, I was very active in the uh, LGBT business uh, resource groups at work. And again, I, it's an important thing to think about is um, remember that some of the people who come in who are allies may be trying to just walk in the room and see how they feel being in the room and wondering, you know, I don't always have to be, you know, you can still be an ally and still be a member of the community. So you, you know, if I try being in those spaces, a lot of those people may be um, people who are exploring. And uh, it's important to keep that in the back of your mind when you engage with allies and make them feel comfortable. Um, moving forward, so some thoughts, and then I'll leave the rest of the time for questions. Um, ways to make it easier for for, for guys. Uh, one, amplify the voices of, 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 of guys who are willing to talk about it, are willing to speak. Um, find a way to, to help get that voice, that message to as many employees as, as you can. Maybe not in an all hands, uh, but perhaps in a way that it's there for the people who find it, but it isn't necessarily put on everybody's desk who's not looking for it. Um, that may be on you know, certain uh, internal blogs or collections of material uh, because uh, when you are almost ready to do this, you just go searching for every little piece of, every shred of information you can get. And I think that what happens is you end up looking for people who, who look kind of like you, who you can see yourself as. Um, so I think that's really important. In fact, it was a, uh, about a year more ago when I connected with somebody throughout an equal and, um, you know, married children, the whole thing. And I said, I emailed them. I was like, why did you decide to be out when, you know, it's not like you're going to be dating. You're married. You have, you, in my mind, I was thinking you have everything to lose. Why would you do that? And he responded to me and said, um, 
because I want guys to have somebody that they can look up to, not look up to per se, but as a role model, somebody that they can see who um, can tell them it's okay. You can have any life you want. And at the time I didn't understand it, but uh, now I do. Um, the other thing is, you know, you want to, you want to be aware of all that baggage that uh, weighs down on guys and, and in events, uh, content that you create, make reference to, to the guys, make reference to the fact that they are there and they're welcome. And of course, I guess my last point is make that content available where guys can find it when they're ready, because when they're ready, they will, they will need to see it and they'll absorb it. They will soak it up. And, um, so I appreciate uh, the fact that you all came to listen to me as my mouth has gone dry a few times, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have. Take a sip of water first. Now, where, where are good places for getting content? Um, uh, will the meeting notes be available? Yeah, I will do that. I, uh, I didn't have a chance to do that ahead of time, but I will do that after and, uh, and be sure to share with you. And anybody who, you know, um, wants to brainstorm around coming up with content ideas, uh, just uh, get in touch with me, email me, contact me through the, through the summit uh, system, and um, we can figure out a time. But uh, I would be, I would love to help anybody who wants to help create content that, uh, that the guys might find valuable. And, um, and uh, you know, I'll be happy to work with you. Uh, about the, the video, no, it's not, it's not public. And, um, but I um, would be willing to share it with you if you, you know, wanted to use it in a sort of an internal way. I, I just, you know, we could just talk about it. Um, not quite there yet for the video to be, everywhere that's another reason why work is great it's limited you know but um but yeah again i'm i'm open to talk to anybody about any of that and and if you all have suggestions on ways to engage to get that engagement um from from men uh, post it in the comments or share it uh because you know again i this is a very new thing for me. So I don't have all the answers. I only can tell you what kind of worked for me. And um, uh, yeah, um, I, I'm very familiar with looking for those role models and I have uh, identified with, you know, all of them and uh, you know, everybody is different. Everybody has a different sort of uh, a way of living and that's terrific. Um, it's great. And the, the more that, that um, can stand up and say, Hey, boring suburban guy. Me too. You know, it, uh, it can be very powerful. Uh, how can I make myself more approachable? Um, how can I uh, become less intimidating? Uh, well, I, I guess I'm not, I don't know how intimidating you are. Um, but I think a good answer to that question is, you know, uh, sometimes just the most casual, uh, conversations or mentions uh, of an awareness of the, uh, the things that, that maybe hold people back uh, opens a conversation. You know, for instance, I'm thinking of this show that uh, we watch, uh, that my kids watch called Owl House on Disney. And there was this uh, a lot of conversation about the fact that uh, that show had um, uh, a first sort of out bisexual lead character and what a milestone that was, you know, in that way, you know, you, that's a conversation that allows me to have a, a much more grown up conversation with my kids uh, about the subject so that they know from an early age that, you know, Hey, whatever, whatever you end up feeling in your heart, that's fine. And that's absolutely okay. Um, but that's the kind of thing that can um, send a message to people that you can, you know, discuss this with me, you know. Um, 
yeah, it's the, things like that, I think, are, are great ways to have conversations. Um, another thing I wanted to share from a meeting that, uh, a session that I attended yesterday, that I think that, that I heard that was really valuable, which was, <clears throat> uh, you know, in the workplace, we hear things that are uh, generally considered acceptable, right? The, uh, the kinds of jokes that, that people tell. And just to, to come back to, to mental illness, you know, uh, one of the things I have is OCD. And uh, one of the real annoying things about having OCD beside the actual illness itself is the fact that it is a, it is a joke. It's a shorthand. It's used in social media. It's, you know, you see it everywhere. In fact, I have a, on my, I have a, I use tweet deck and I have a column for OCD where I, I engage with other people who have OCD and, and are struggling with certain aspects of it. And also sometimes I find, you know, new research or new studies about it. But for every one of those tweets, there'll be a, somebody at a gas station tweeting, you know, oh, my OCD, I got the, 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 the numbers lined up. Or, you know, people will, you know, make jokes about it you know, dividing their M&Ms by color and say, oh, I'm OCD. And I had somebody make one of those types of jokes uh, at, around a table at work one time. And, you know, you might think it's up to the OCD guy to say, hey, that's, that really makes me uncomfortable. It's not funny. And it's really, you know, I really wish you wouldn't do that. Um, but I think the best ally move is when you don't put it on the person who is most likely to be upset, but somebody else stands up and says, um, hey, that's, that might, you know, jokes like that don't, don't make people feel too good. Um, it trivializes something that's very serious. And I think if you hear something um, about sexual orientation, you need to think, don't wait for, you know, somebody to say, hey, it's me and I'm upset. Stand up for them. Then that person, now that person is somebody that somebody can go to and, and, and talk to or confide in. Um, uh, how to make a, a white bisexual man fight for equality or at least wake up. Yeah, um, yeah, it's not, uh, look, I don't get credit for jumping to it early, that's for sure. Um, but I think that the more who can, should and I, I feel that um, ultimately the it, it's it's in, if you can I think you should in in whatever way you can if it's at work it's at work if it's more than that great um, but I think I want to say you have an obligation to stand up but I think you have to make that you have to take that into into your decision making um, when you decide who your trusted uh, friends and family are um, to decide how how can I be vocal for those who can't and if you feel comfortable if you have a good employer um, who um, supports that kind of thing you know that video you know I didn't have to try and get people to watch it you know my, my, you know, the BRG leaders took care of that and, um, and it got in front of the people who needed to hear it. Yes, to my family, yes. Not well, um, you know, to my, you know, my family here are my wife and, uh, well, I guess my wife. Um, the rest, that's, haven't, haven't, um, haven't figured that one out yet. I mean, it's not that I can't, it's just that I just, sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I have the energy for that conversation right now. Um, but you know, it's, that's like working a muscle, right? You, you keep doing it and you get better at it. You get more casual, you get more easy. The problem is, you know, working up to the first time, it feels like you're climbing Mount Everest. You know, I, I worked with a therapist, uh, and that was the entire focus. How do, I, how do I bring this up that I've accepted this? How do I talk about it? How do I, you know, make it easy? Um, because it is a challenge, right? If you have, if you have a family. Um, the answer is you can do it. And um, the more you do it, the easier it is, I guess. And um, so I encourage anybody who can to do that.
And the other thing, the other thing that, that weighed on me was the idea of, you know, what if, if I don't, what if my kids, you know, one day um, could have benefited from that either for their own, as they grow up, you know, if they had grown up not knowing that they could identify, they could come to me, right? <laughs> that I'm right here in the house. And, and to think that by not speaking of it, not accepting it, trying to continue to stuff it and hide it and deny it, then that's cheating my own kids. And I don't want to do that. Um, so that helped. That helped a lot with uh, getting over the, the hurdle there. And I'm going to have to go back at some point after our, this session is over to read the rest of the chat. And I apologize for not being able to follow all of it. It was very lively. And um, <clears throat> I'm really glad for that. Um, how many people identify with the notion that you can't be bi without having had sexual relationships with multiple genders? I'm not saying I do. Um, I think my, my take on that is a great question. Is, um, I, it's like telling a 13-year-old you know, boy, do you know if you, know, you like girls or not? Uh, they know. I mean, I think that they're pretty clear on what they like, whether they've you know, figured out how they're ever going to uh, engage with one in real life. I think you know. And um, I think it, uh, it's, not, it's not something that's required. There's no, there's no uh, test to validate that you have done the things needed to do to carry the title. Uh, and that gets back to the issue of, you know, um, people constantly being questioned about, about it. Um, oh yeah, how do you know? How do you know that you are? Well, I do. Um, how can you be sure? It's like, why would I go through all this if I, if I wasn't sure? Um, I think the easiest and most gentle thing to do with people is to say, okay, if you are, then you are. If you say you are, then that's all I need to know. You know, I think that a lot, I heard in other sessions um, this week, you know, people talking about how the coming out process leads immediately to a bunch of, um, at times, very very uh, personal questions that, um, you know, you kind of need to be ready to deflect, um, uh, be sarcastic about, uh, you know, because nobody, nobody does this to other things. Nobody, you know, you, if, if I say, I, you know, I have anxiety. Why do you think that? What? Because I'm stressed all the time. I feel it's like, have you been to a psychiatrist to confirm it? It's like, okay, you could, you could try and argue. Uh, with that, or you could just trust them and the fact that they've come and told you this thing and, and just be, uh, be gentle and supportive is always probably the best way. Man, there's some good stuff in here that I'm not going to get to. I, I'm, I'm bummed about that. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Cynthia was, was talking about, um, the internalized homophobia and uh, the resistance to, you know, sort of accepting uh, that part of it, of, of, of part of, uh, essentially part of, you know, it's part of you. So um, it, is a, it is a kind of weird uh, process, but I think it does, um, it's liberating. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You don't have to try and figure it out anymore. <clears throat> you just, you know, that's a part of you. So there you go. Uh, I mean, I, I just remember I've been with uh, my therapist and, and um, a feeling just a literally lighter, like I was not carrying a backpack full of, you know, cinder blocks and had just left it behind. I was like, how, how is, am I walking like this now? All of the things that I used to waste time with, <clears throat> are these shoes, you know, are they too, you know, is that, am I, do I, am I, is, am I talking in a way, am I, all, I mean, all this stuff that happens from, from an early age that is just, oh my God, it's just not good for you. Yeah, great, great stuff, great conversation in the, uh, um, thing. So you have to identify as gay. Man, this thing's moving fast. You guys are really, you guys are talking almost as much as I am, I think, which is great. 
Mm. Yeah, as a bi woman, um, Sarah's talking about uh, helpful to understand how to make a safe space for bi peers to join the conversation. So much to do. Grateful to do it with more change makers. And, you know, again, I think there, there yeah, there's ways to have these conversations where you can uh, bring that into the conversation. Um, uh, to include to include guys in ways that 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 maybe are more likely to to bring them in <clears throat> and um you know uh i don't have all the answers yet but i uh i love the fact that we are thinking about this stuff and um and you know it would be great to to know that uh maybe at every single company every single right thinking uh open company um could have among the the you know the out role models however the programs are set up where you are you know a man who's 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 comfortable addressing the topic who could do a lunch and learn on it and 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 be able to speak to all the things we've talked about over the last hour um even when people don't know how to ask questions people who are not even uh here with us today because it's not something that they would think would be uh something they need to do but um comfortable enough to go to those places. I got to that with mental illness where I could, you know, you could pretty much ask me, do you want to talk about, about your mental illness to a group of, I don't know, whatever, uh, zoologists? Fine. Yeah, I don't care. I'm happy to always talk about it because I, I want the, the stigma gone. So um, I want to show my face and, and, and say if, if uh, you know, if, if you think crazy person and, and it's not, if that doesn't look like what you think I look like, then great, I've done my job because I want you to realize that a lot of people are in your life who have it and are uncomfortable sharing it with you because they think you will think uh, bad things. Same thing with this. I want uh, to be as many people who are willing to say, oh, is this not what you expected? Um, uh, not to say that you know the suburban middle-aged guy is like the perfect uh, example, but the idea is that you want to present as many as you can possibly present because depending on who it is in your company who is looking to see somebody that they can identify with, um, then you want to, you want to have a selection. Uh, and you can only get that by getting the first one. And then the first one brings the second one forward. And then eventually you have enough people where you can, um, uh, somebody who might be uh, at a much earlier place in life can say, yeah, but doesn't that mean that this or I can't live my life like that? It's like, well, have you seen Mark? He's like that. He enjoys football. Uh, he likes the Georgia Bulldogs and he's got kids and goes to, you know, softball games and buys anybody could ever imagine. So you can be whatever you want to be. And I think great to have as many role models as possible. Uh, yeah, okay, men who might be bi plus. Yeah, I mean, it's always possible. You never know. I mean, and speaking of role models, best one, best one that really touched me was, you know, I'm late to the game, but after the Emmy uh, Awards, uh, watching uh, Schitt's Creek and, and the fantastic scene uh, with, um, uh, my mind just went blank, but uh, his name, you know, the main, one of the main characters is the son. And he's, he begins having a, 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 a sexual relationship with uh, one of the employees at the yeah, Dan Levy uh, at the hotel. And afterwards, she's like, "I thought you were, uh, you know, they're buying wine. I thought you were, I thought you were pretty much a red wine." And he's like, "Yeah, I like red wine, but I also like white wine. And you know, uh, I've also had, you know, been with a, a Riesling that 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 previously was a Merlot. And it's like it was the most effortless." It was the most effortless thing. And I just remember when I watched that, I just like got this like kind of like chill of like happiness that, you know, that somebody uh, who could have been like me at an early age will see that and go like, and that's all you would ever have to say to anybody, you know? That's all you would ever have to say is like, yeah, I do like that. And I, I've also liked this. I'm kind of, you know, at pick and choose based on person, you know? I'm, I'm not like focused only on a set of equipment that any one person might have. Um, so with that, I thank you all for being here. I wish I could have enact, uh, engaged with you more directly. Um, maybe, maybe one day, um, we can all bring somebody from our companies together for a, for a really lively panel like this and, uh, hope I will be part of it. And, um, if you do want to talk more about how I, you know, 
can help in any way that I can with your company, um, please just reach out to me. And um, thank you guys. Thanks so much. And I think if I, if I paid attention at sessions yesterday, uh, folks were hanging around. I guess this is like the, you know, at a, at a in real life session when, you know, everybody walks out, but then like 25 people talk to the presenter uh, in the room until they're kicked out by the next group. So I'm happy to hang. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. I didn't um, know if I was making sense most of the time, but I appreciate the, uh, the thanks. And I think um, for reaching me, I think the information that you would need is in the, uh, is in the, you know, the workplace summit, whatever. You can find my contact information there. Uh, David, just uh, just get in touch with me about the the video, and we can figure it. We can figure out a way to do that. Oh, and John, about kids. Um, it's you know my kids are still relatively young. Um, one's right now in kindergarten where they go for two hours a day in a hybrid model. They're here at home when I'm trying to work and also trying to help them with their prod, my uh, fifth grader who's doing a project on Jamestown and I'm like getting frustrated trying to find the answer in the reading, you know, and I'm like not doing my own work. And, uh, but uh, you know, one of them is at the age when I think we can have that conversation and the other one wouldn't get it. But um, uh I'm, I'm looking, I'm actually looking forward to that conversation. I think it's going to happen soon. And um, I'm, 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 I think it'll make uh, us have a deeper bond as a, a dad and a daughter to, um, to, to see, for her to see me expose that um, to her and to know that, you know, it's okay not to know who you are, especially for God's sake, when you're 10 years old, you don't have to have it figured out. Um, but I really, you know, I think back, well, forget it. I did get there. I, I could have got there a lot sooner, but I, I did. I got there. I got there. And here I am. Look at me. The Workplace Summit. Sean talking about being 50 plus. And uh, yes, you and me too. You uh, brothers in the, in, the, in the 50 plus category, getting those insistent letters from AERP and they can just basically take that thing and just, uh, I don't want that. So don't send those to me. Uh, Robin, that was, you know, that was a more challenging conversation to have. Um, but thankfully I had a, a pretty, um, I went looking for a therapist who was, had, who knew how to handle this type of stuff, who was very uh, focused on it. And uh, we, I mean, we literally like role played it and, and everything. And my, my issue is trying to figure out what is this going to make, what concerns will this cause? And then how can I address them? And, um, and the ultimate answer just to really shrink it into super short was just to not make it a big, just to not come into it. Like a, I have a dramatic announcement to make, but rather, Hey, this worked out, this happened in therapy and it's helped me figure this out. Boom. And that's basically how it went. And, um, you know, it does create questions when you have, when you're already in a relationship, it does create questions. You know, like, what does this mean for us? Well, nothing, <laughs> you know, nothing. Um, except now you know me better. But the funny thing is for the, for some people was, you know, the, the few I've really confided in, they're like, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I'm like, what? It doesn't, what? Are you kidding me right now? This should be a shock. This should be shocking news. But you never know. Yeah, and if any, anybody wants to, you know, engage on any of those questions about um, family and, you know, 
being at a certain place in life where it seems like you have a lot on the line, um, please reach out to me. I, I would love to, uh, I would love to connect. The other thing, the other one thing I will say about this, you know, figuring it out and people thinking they know things about you. Um, it's funny when you decide that you've concluded something that needs, that is true. And it's just a matter of, you know, how do you embrace it? Then you look back at your life and then you start to see this uh, steady, very clear uh, uh, blinking light that how did you not notice this before? I mean, truthfully, you, I did. I just, you know, it was just so... I smothered it as soon as the, the shoot came through the, gr the, the ground, you know, the, the, to grow. And, um, but man, it was like persistent. Like, you know, I just like, oh, there was that, there was that, there was that, 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 you know, back to the earliest memories I have as a, as a kid. I mean, it's always been there. And I've always fought, I had always fought to pretend it wasn't. You guys are a great group. I really appreciate it. I didn't think anybody would show up. No, I did, but. Yes, indeed, Robin, indeed. I don't know. I don't know how many people were in the session, but I will uh, like to know. Jose, I, yeah, I, I, you know, I think, I think it opens up an actual authentic conversation. And when it comes to kids, Anytime you can have a real conversation, it's like, uh, it's a rare opportunity. David, oh my God, amen to that. Uh, that had so much profound impact on me as a kid. I mean, just, and as, you know, in college, and it was just so, uh, you know, there was not, you didn't get a, you didn't get a positive message about any of this stuff. And there was just like so much reason to think, you know, uh, you know, the, like the media report from the UK said, you know, it's like, this is a ticket to doom. This is a ticket to destruction. This is a ticket to ruining everything um, and possibly dying. So why would you want to have anything to do with that? So, I mean, yeah, I, you know, lack of role models, really lousy things happening in the world and people being blamed for them. I mean, that is like a constant reminder, like from society saying, you don't want to do that. You don't want that to be something people think about you, right? That's, that's not something that you want to do. And uh, it's, it's hard to work past that. And I, I really am intrigued to see some of the research from the younger cohorts, you know, high school kids going into college today and the much more open-minded um, acceptance of, of, you know, just a fluidity in every, in every regard. And the fact that, um, you know, uh, it's okay to be whatever you are. And uh, I think that's amazing. 